Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We are absolutely privileged to have you guys here on Father's Day. All the men say, huh. Yeah, I love that. Happy Father's Day to you guys. Uh, Really appreciate you. I got a message specifically for the men here this morning. We do begin a series entitled, I Love My Church. And um, usually, we've probably, this is our fourth time doing this maybe, or so. And usually the emphasis has been the capital C. That's why the C is underlined. It's the capital C church, meaning that um, to have a vision, to have um, a picture of of something bigger than just our little church here, because we're just a part of something bigger here on this earth. Amen. But uh, this time we're going to focus on this church. We're going to focus on the mission and the the mission and the thing that God has given to us uh, to reach out to our community. So we've got some stories that we want to share. We've got some interviews that Mike's been doing, and we'll show one every single week. And I think it's going to be a blessing to all of us. Now, the, the interesting thing is we've been here, what, Natalie, 15 years already, 2007. And God has done an amazing work in this ministry. Little did I know. Uh, what was going to come about as we said yes to this. You know, we'd been ministering for 20 plus years in another church, and we finally resigned 2006. And then um, I was getting away, because I thought I was going to take a year off and just kind of relax and do nothing. Actually, I was thinking about selling vacuum cleaners or selling insurance or something, and that didn't happen. And so I went away to Mason, Texas in 2006 to get some instruction for the next mission. And immediately the Lord spoke and said, I want you to come back home and tell the people how much I love them. And I'm like, wait a minute, Lord. He goes, home. He goes, we could go anywhere in the world. We've known people all over the world. And we were empty nesters. There's nobody around. And we were ready to just to go wherever and obey. But he said, nope, come back home. Tell them how much I love them. I was like, Seguin, it's like, this is the, I left that place a long time ago. Goes, and, and so, so, and I told him, I said, Lord, I thought your word said that a prophet's not welcome back in his own hometown. He goes, yeah, he goes, it does say that. He goes, but I'm not asking you to be a prophet. I'm asking you to be a pastor. And so I said, yes, sir. So that's what I said in that video. I was like, hey, Christianity, it's not a, a democracy where you get to vote. It's a kingdom. And when the king speaks, you obey. So we submitted ourselves to the will of God. And here we are 15 years later. And God's been doing an awesome work in this ministry through you guys. Now, the reason why, little did I know uh, why he wanted us back home, because we were nervous about coming back to this area, because we had kind of did some damage in this area to individuals because of our lifestyle. And so uh, we had broken, you know, a lot of uh, bridges and burned a lot of bridges, I'm sorry, and we just hurt, hurt people, not, well, I guess physically also, not like beating them up. Well, Natalie might have had some fights, but... <clears throat> But we, we, he wanted us to come back into this place and restore a, a misunderstanding of who our father was. And I think you guys have been doing an awesome job in doing that. Psalm 68 says it this way. You got, Bill, do you have that one? It's all, it says that God sets the solitary in families. The scripture says that our father, he is a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of the widows. He's the God in his holy habitation. He sets the solitary. When you look at that word solitary, it means that that's the wanderer, that's the lonely, that's the friendless, that's the one that feels abandoned, the one that feels like an outcast. He goes, he'll set those individuals who are broken and hurting and feel like they're not wanted either by people or by God himself, he'll set those individuals and he'll make them a part of a family. And that's exactly what we've been seeing here. I see men and women who have come into this place broken and wounded and hurting. And I was like, good God, why are you bringing those folks here? Just because I can trust you. Because you're not going to abandon them. You're not going to just say, you know what? I don't know what to do with you. Go down to the Baptist church. As a matter of fact, it's the other way around. Those folks, the sheriff department, police department, different individuals, when they don't know what to do with people, they said, send them to Crossroads Church. Because they know what to do. It's like, actually, we don't know what to do, but we know the one who can tell them what to do. So we point them to Jesus. And that's one of our core values is Jesus, not us. Uh, we always have folks that tell us, he goes, well, pastor, just show me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. It's like, no, I'm going to point you to him so he can tell you what to do. And that's between you and him and not me and you. And so it's a, it's a beautiful thing what God has done. And I know one of the main things that 
um, that he has us here for us to help restore that idea of the Father's heart and how the Father loves us and loves the city and loves the broken people. You know, when Jesus came on the scene, they had a religious crowd and then they had individuals who should have been leading the church and they were misrepresenting who dad was. They were misrepresenting who the father was. They were shunning people. They were quarantining people that were sick and afflicted. And Jesus comes in and he goes into that quarantine place and he brings them out and sets them free. Uh, rather than disregarding the, the lepers, he would go and touch the lepers. Rather than those that were being afflicted for 12 years and, and bleeding out, he would go in there and minister his healing power to them and forgive individuals who were committing adultery. He just blew their mind away. And when I see that and I see the life of Jesus, uh, Jesus himself said, he goes, when you see me, you see me, you see the Father working through me. And so all of a sudden I captured that heart when I was 19 years old. And I can't, I can't turn away from individuals who are down and out. It's just an automatic pull inside of me. Why? Because that's where he found me. In my worst state, he came down and lifted me up and set my feet on a rock. And it's been 30 something years since I've been serving him and I'm so proud of my daddy. As a matter of fact, the title of this morning's message is, Thanks Pops. Because that's exactly, when I woke up today, I was like, man, thanks Pops. I've been shooting some text messages to my girls. I got three daughters, and um, I'll, uh, I'll shoot, you know, I hardly ever see them. They're, some of them are in ministry, others are, they're just busy with their lives just like we all are. And so I said, man, I better, I better talk to these girls, or at least text them, so that they'll know, and I can remind them who I actually am, <laughs> right? And so I'll text them, and I'll encourage them, and I'll, you know, just um, share my thoughts of, 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 of what I was thinking when they were born and just whatever comes to my heart. And every now and then, uh, I'll get the response from the girls and say, man, thanks, Pops. I'm going to keep that one forever because I didn't know that that's what you were thinking when I was born or whatever. And so that mor this morning, that's my hope is that whenever you guys walk out of this place, every, every single one of us, that we're going to be able to um, walk out of this place and just look up and say, man, thanks, Pops. Thanks for being so good to us. And so we're going to take a look at that this morning. Is that okay? Yes. So it's a mixture of a, of a couple of things that I have in my heart, but I think I've, I've nailed it down after the first service. I cried my eyes off. I was going to say something else in the first service. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I hope this doesn't happen in the second service. Because I just wanted to convey something that's in my heart that's so, that's so uh, close to me and personal to me, especially to the men. Because men are hard on themselves, aren't you guys? I mean, seriously, you always look at the, wor the worst in you. And it's like, man, I wish I could have done that. I wish I could have done that. I wish I would have done this different. And if I would have just said this, or if I would have just taught them this, maybe they wouldn't have been in that situation. And sometimes we, we, we're so hard on ourselves that it's hard to, for us to look up to our Heavenly Father and uh, to receive His goodness and His kindness and His, and His, and His compassion and forgiveness. Because sometimes we, we, we um, look at God as, as if though we're looking at our own dads. And I don't know about you, but I was grounded a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> and sometimes I see my dad as, man, he's going to ground me now. And so I don't even look up. I don't even ask him anything because I deserve to be grounded. Does that make sense? And I want you to know that the Father's heart is the exact opposite of that. And when you walk out of this place, you're going to have free. You're going to be free and you're going to be able to see your dad as he truly is in Scripture. And you're going to be able to look up with confidence and say, man, thanks, Pops. I appreciate that. Now, some of us um, have had horrible earthly dads. And uh, you can't even connect, really, a lot of who your Heavenly Father is without that image just kind of suffocating some of the truth that we find in God's Word. And I want you to know that um, never, never, what do you call that, um, compare your earthly dad to what your heavenly fathers. If us being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him, amen? We just have a small glimpse of who our dad is. So dads, happy Father's Day. My brother, happy Father's Day. See, you got all, I know that's just one of many kids you have. <laughs> it's a blessing. Um, in your notes, there's some maps. I'm gonna share a story with you from Luke's gospel when Jesus talks about you know, the prodigal son. 
And I know when he talks about the prodigal son, we sometimes emphasize um, the idea about the son, the two sons, the two boys. And I want to look at that story today and look at it from the, from the perspective of the dad and, and, and get some truth out of that. Amen? Amen. And so one of the things that we're going to do is um, share some stories. So this morning we have a young man, Preston and Jamie Lore, who began coming here. I don't even know. Jamie, are you here? I mean, Preston, are you here? I don't even see you guys. You're skipping church. For those of you who are online, Preston, if you're online, hello, brother. <laughs> but um, they came here out of Pennsylvania, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, man, it's just a supernatural thing that God did. But they were broken. Their hearts were broken. And it's just amazing to me whenever I communicate with individuals who start coming to the church, the story behind it and how God brought them to Seguin and how God brought them into this place. And all of a sudden, they're a part of this community. And I'm telling you why right now. Because he can trust you with those that are hurting. He can trust you with those that are bruised and wounded. That you're not going to sit there and judge them and say, man, I don't want to be a part of their lives. Mijo, stay away from them. They're bad people. Well, they're bad, but they've come to this place to get free, to get help, to get strengthened. I remember when we first started opening the doors to this church, uh, people would come up to me and, and they would say, uh, Pastor, we got a guy outside smoking cigarettes. I'm like, well, tell him to go to the smoking section. It's over there. Like, what? I didn't know we had one. It's like, yeah, I seen you over there. No. Well, you know, it was just really, really interesting. This one guy that, that uh, I've shared this story before, this one guy who came in uh, who was smoking out there. And of course, all the visitors coming in and they're smelling what Marlboro's or whatever's coming out. And so I go out there. I'm, they, they, somebody told me. So I went out there to go see who this guy was. And at uh, first, I'm looking at him. I'm sizing him up. I was like, man, I know I can't take this guy. Because he'll just tear me up for, for, you know, for real. And so I, and the Spirit of the Lord said, don't say nothing to him. Just introduce yourself to him. And so I went and I introduced myself to him. And uh, what was his name, babe? Bubba. Yeah, Bubba. We'll just call him Bubba. That was his name, Bubba. <laughs> and uh, he, he talked for a minute, introduced myself. And that was it. I didn't say anything about him smoking or anything. I was, actually, I said, hey, give me have a puff. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and smoked a cigarette and so I was 12, 18 years old or something like that. Little did I know that Bubba was hurting and wounded and bruised. Bubba sat back there where Cindy's at. And he just sat there and just watched the service. A few weeks before, he had just lost his mom. She died. Two weeks after that, dad committed suicide because he couldn't cope with mom not being around. He had taken a gun and shot himself, but it, he tried to shoot himself, but the blank, it, it went blank, the, the gun didn't go off. And so he was broken. He wanted to take his life out. And somebody said, he goes, hey, man, you need to go to this church over there. It's called Crossroads. And that's why he was here. Little did I know. I had no, no idea. But in the message, God spoke to him and God restored him and God healed him. And he got saved that morning. Because he saw, he actually, what he saw, what he saw were two elderly people in the back row making out. Seriously. We have confirmation. We have people who saw that. We have confirmation. And we have never seen those elderly people ever back here in this church again. <laughs> but they were there that day making out. And this man was just lost his mom and his dad. And when we asked people to greet, those elderly folks came up to him and just began to hug him and began to love on him. And something broke in that moment. He surrendered his life to Christ and he's the follower of Jesus right now. Amen. And he's so thankful. And he's so, all of a sudden he saw a different picture of who our heavenly father was. Because he thought, walking into this place, man, who is this God that he takes away my mom, he takes away my dad the way he's done. But God restored his life. And so these are the kind of folks, the stories that I hear whenever you guys are talking to me, I'm just blown away, but now it doesn't, it doesn't uh, surprise me why God's sending us here and why, why he's sending you guys here. You know, I was out there at the, t getting some... Um, water the other day, I think it was last week or the week before, and I heard one of our leaders, they were in there messing around in the kitchen with four or five ladies talking, and I heard them say, overhear them say, he goes, hey, we're going to be taking you some meals. Oh, no, Mijo, we don't need it. You don't need any meals. We're all right. He goes, no, we're going to take them whether you like them or not. This particular lady was going into the hospital, and she was coming back home, and they, they provided meals for her for uh, the next two weeks. They made arrangements like that. And man, that touched my heart deeply. Why? Because it was my mom that they were taking a meal to. 
They didn't have to do that, but that's an automatic expression of who they are as they yield themselves to the Father's heart. It's just beautiful what we're seeing. And so in this case with the Lohr family, um, they were broken and wounded in another state. And God answers the cry of a man and a wife who breaks down and gets on their knees in humility to seek God for help. And so all of a sudden he invades in that situation and, and he sends them to a whole other state called Texas in Seguin and, um, and brings them over here to this place. And I told them, I said afterwards, I said, you know what? God restored you. He heard your cry, but he not only got you a job and made provision for you, he brought you to a family. And so we pick up that story right here in Luke's gospel, the 12th chapter, and we'll read it uh, there together. And it says this, Jesus continues, there's a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to the father, father, give me this portion of goods that fails to, falls to me. It's just like the baby of the family, right? Daddy, I want this. And daddy gives it to him. Spoiled brat. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathers it all. He journeys to a far country, and there he wastes the possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent everything, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he goes and he joins himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent, and he sent him to his fields to feed the swine. He says, okay, you need a job? I'm going to take you out to the fields. There's some pigs out there. I want you to go feed them. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. You want to go out there on your own? Guess what? You're on your own, right? You're going to fend for yourselves. When he came to himself, though, he said, how many of my father's, he begins to think about his dad. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and and despair, and I perish with hunger? I'm going to rise and go back to my dad. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I feel so bad about what I did. I don't even, I, I don't even want a place of a sonship. I just, want, I just want to be a servant. I just want to get back home. And what happens? He arose and he comes to his father. But when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted goat to make some cabrito or some menudo, and let us eat and be merry, for this is my son. He was dead and he's now alive again. He was lost and now he is found, and they began to be merry. Isn't that a great story? But we can talk about the prodigal son. We can talk about the older brother because the older brother got mad also. You guys remember the story. He thought he deserved what the father had. And sometimes, you know, we're one of two. We either get the stuff that God, God gives us or the things that the, the, the father gives us and we, and we go spend it on stupid stuff. We take advantage of that whole situation or we, we, we think that we've earned our salvation or earned his goodness or earned it because we're so good and we've behaved so well. Well, both of us are wrong. Both of them are prodigals. But when you look at it from the father's perspective, you see a dad who is absolutely amazing dad. First of all, what I see is this, is that he is generous with his possessions. Say generous. Generous. I don't know if you've ever seen God um, like a God who's closed-fisted and he's a tightwad, so to speak. Like you're going to have to do something good. You're going to have to earn God's blessings on your life. But that's just not true. He's generous. This son, it says, Father, give me a share of my estate. So what happens? The dad gives it to him. He's open-handed. He's not closed-fisted. He's not so strict that you have to, he's asking you to perform. He's asking you to do something. Read your Bible every day until you start going to this church. Then I'll think about opening up the doors and you getting the job and that promotion that you need. No, it's not who our father is. The father willingly, you know, generously opens up his hand to bless you. When my girls um, mis- mishandled some of the provision that I'd given to them, I-, I wouldn't the dad that says, you know what, you're not getting anything anymore. You know, for another year, no allowance. 
because I read some of the scriptures, I would go back and give them more because I wanted them to understand a proper way of using money. That'd be, you know, you don't, you don't withhold something from them. How are they ever going to learn? And so he generously does that. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but we, in, in, in Genesis, when, when we talk about Adam, the first, you know, the first man, the scripture says that God blessed Adam before Adam did anything. As a matter of fact, he does that to birds and, and, and the field, the flowers of the field. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't do it, but your heavenly father feeds them and takes care of them and clothes them. How much more are you more valuable than they? That's who your dad is, right? And let me tell you something, that here's the truth. God provides, not because you're good, God provides because he's good. Just remember that. But never think and shut your mind off that God's not willingly, open-handedly wanting to bless you and to prosper you. You don't need to live on um, food stamps or whatever the rest of your life. There's a season for that, but God wants to prosper you and be in health. He wants to make all, all the resources that he has are available to every single one of us. Amen. As a matter of fact, in, in Luke's gospel, the 12th chapter, it says this, that Jesus said it this way. He goes, listen, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Man, your heavenly father will take care of these things for you. And he says this, he goes, fear not, don't be afraid. Fear not, my little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says, if, I'm an, if I fear of anything, it's, I'm an, I fear that you, you misunderstand who, the, who my dad is. It is of my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You don't need to be afraid of his hand. Amen. The second thing that I see in this story is that he overflows with compassion. He overflows with compassion. You know, when the sun went out and he came to his senses, it says, I'm going to tell this to my dad. I'm going I'm to go back and I'm going to say, you know what? I don't no longer, you know, am worthy of being a son. Just make me a servant. And so when he's going back, before he's able to say anything, before he's ever, ever, ever able to communicate that to his dad, the dad sees him away far off and he runs towards him. And he embraces him and he hugs him and he kisses him. And that reminded me of when I came to Christ, I knew that in my heart, man, I, I needed to change. And that Saturday morning, before I called, he answered there's a passage of scripture in Isaiah that says, before you call, it shall come to pass that before you even ask, man, I'm going to answer you. That's exactly, he overflows. God overflows with compassion. He's not waiting for you to do something, then compassion comes. When Jesus looked at the crowd and the 5,000 people, he saw that they were wandering and they were without a shepherd. And it says, compassion came upon him and he went and fed them. Compassion always leads to action. And that's exactly what the father did here. Before he was able to say anything from, hear anything from that son, the father overflowed with compassion and gave him what he didn't deserve, which was his grace, his mercy. Amen? Amen. I want you to see your dad right now as him running towards you from that back door, running to your seat. Picture him running to your seat. Picture him holding on to you and embracing you and giving you a kiss on the cheek, a big sloppy wet kiss. And say, son, I love you. I see your hurt and I see your pain, but I love you. My heart's overflowing with goodness towards you. I'm here for you. And the last thing that I see in this story, is not only that his compassion is overflowing, that his generosity is, is just full. He's full of generous with his possessions. But the last thing is this, is that he's quick to forgive. Finally, the son speaks and he says, Father, and he shares what we just talked about earlier. I've sinned. I'm not worthy to be a, a, a son anymore. I just want to be a servant. And what, is it, what does the dad do? How does the dad respond? The father says to his servants, he goes, quick quick and he gets what the robe and so the servants don't don't wear these robes these robes are only worn by a family They're, these robes are only worn by the sons and he says and basically what he's saying he goes man he's quick to forgive he goes you can't you're not going to be a servant you're going to be you're my son and he's quick to forgive i love it when i've done this to my kids i love it when 
I share with my children something that they feel like they don't deserve. The other day, my daughter came, and you know my daughter, my oldest daughter's been running a little bit. Not a little bit, she's been running a lot for several years. We've been praying for her for a dozen years, probably. And it hurts my heart because I know that there's so much more for her. <clears throat> the other day, she's sitting around in the backyard, just walking around. And I said, Aaron, come here. So she comes in here and I just give her a hug and I give her a hundred dollar bill. She just looks at me like, cause she spent a lot of my money already. I'm like, if anything, you owe me several hundred of those. But I saw my father's heart in that moment and I extended my provision that I had and it's like, hey, it's just, what, what's that for? It's nothing. It's just, you're my daughter. I love you. Of course, she just teared up a little bit and left and spent that money, I'm sure. And your dad does the same. Might feel like you don't deserve it, but I'm telling you, he has gone above and beyond to show you that yeah, you might not deserve it, but I'm still willing to believe in you and to trust in you. I had, my, my father was here in the first service, and man, I'm telling you, this image is so embedded in my heart because of what dad did years ago. Little did I know that this, this moment in my life would forever seal a, a, a different picture in my heart about my heavenly father. My dad was pretty strict. He was, he was very strict, actually. I was grounded probably 17 years of my 18 years in life. I was one of those kids. I probably deserved all of it. And there was this one year that I felt really bad about my life, and I felt like I, you know, I was I was not a good son. And it was Christmas time, and for us at our family, we don't celebrate Christmas until midnight Christmas Eve. We got to wait, we got to stay up, and everybody's tired and asleep and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not going to get anything anyways. I, I don't even deserve to get anything. I'm probably going to get nothing. And sure enough, that midnight comes and everybody's opening their gifts and man my brother got all kinds of stuff my sister got all kinds of stuff people were getting all kinds of stuff and I got a pair of socks and some underwear and the crazy thing is I look back I felt like that's all I deserved anyways so I sat there and waited for the whole shenanigans to take place and um, to top it all off, after everybody finished, dad comes up, he goes, hey, because I need you to get all this trash and take it out to the back. I'm like, dang, man, kick me in the, you know, it's, it's already enough that I just get socks and underwear. Now I got to pick up the trash and take it to the back. And so I grab it, I obeyed, and I was out, went outside, I opened up the back door and I was out there going towards the backyard to throw this stuff in the trash. Then I heard uh, the door behind me. I'm like, man, I bet that's daddy's gonna say something to me. And so I just kept walking and I stopped and he goes, son, come here. And he comes up to me and he says, here. For several months, he had been, he's a, uh, what do you call that? Shade tree mechanic. He would always fix cars or what have you. And for a few months, he had been working on this car out in the backyard. I was like, Dad, what are you working on? This car's been here for so long. Because oh, I'm working, I'm working, I'm going to fix it for this guy, I know. I'm like, okay. So he, when he calls me back, he gives me the keys. I said, what is that? He goes, that's the keys to this car right here. He goes, it's your son. I love you. Merry Christmas. Man, I was blown away. But I was so thankful to have this awesome, light blue, ugly Plymouth Fury <laughs> from my family. <laughs> I embraced him, and I felt like I didn't deserve it, and I probably didn't deserve it, but he demonstrated something that my father wants to demonstrate to every single one of you, that even though you feel like you might not deserve it, man, he's still going to extend his warm hand towards you, because that's who he is. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m., or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessing.